I think the books you read as a child stay with you for the rest of your life, because that's when your powers of imagination are at their peak. When I was a child, I used to read quite a lot. There were many authors whose work I enjoyed, but there was one particular writer who meant more to me than all the rest. The writer I'm talking about is E. Nesbitt, the author of The Railway Children, which is why it was such a thrill for me when I landed the part of Roberta in the film version of that book. I really love being in the film because the children are all so believable. They keep trying to do the right thing, but they're always getting it wrong, and there's something very endearing about that. After making the film, I started to look at E. Nesbitt, the person, who of course turned out actually to be a woman, Edith Nesbitt. I mean, when I was you know, first reading, it was just E and it could have been Edward. And in fact, she writes very much from a boy's point of view. But no, this woman emerged that was probably in many ways different from the sort of person you might expect from the stories. And it really made me look at her work to see why it was that she seemed to carry on into this present day. Edith Nesbitt was a prolific writer of poetry and prose for adults as well as children. But it's the dozen or so children's books she produced around the turn of the century which have given her classic status. Many of these books have been in print for more than 90 years, an achievement that's rarely been matched. I think if you're trying to place E. Nesbitt, she's in some kind of premier league, if you like. I mean, as a child, I could recognize straight away, think that she, this is one of the few writers who was on the side of children. I mean, in the war between adults and children, it's quite clear she was on our side. The more I find out about Nesbitt, the more I want to know. She didn't really belong, I think, in the Edwardian period. Uh, and, uh, and that actually shows many times in the way the children are sending up society. They're very funny in the way they look at the things around them. And she uses them all the time to point up this rather peculiar society she's living in. How do you do? Hi. How do you do? Yes. Could I ask you two questions? Yeah, well, it does depend what they are. I can't spend all day conversationalizing with the junior public. Now, what are they? Yeah, that's to tell how much coal there is, you see, in case anybody nicks it. Now, second question, please. Do you know anything about engines? Do I know anything about engines? Why? Because I've got one, and it blew up. It blew up? Well, excuse me, young man, I've got I think there's something quite magical about her writing. Um, she actually explores magic all the time, which is fascinating to a child. You know, the possibilities of things happening that can't really, but maybe they do. You're never quite sure whether it's in your head or could actually happen. I do believe something is going to happen. The boundaries are completely changed. That's the magic of it. She makes you realize that the children's imagination go beyond and take them to another place, even though they're contained entirely by their own garden wall or whatever. I am not nearly cool yet. She may not be as well known as children's authors such as Kenneth Graham or Roald Dahl, 
but 20th century children's literature effectively began with E. Nesbitt, and no one's had a greater impact on how it's developed since. I think you can speak of British and American children's literature as before and after E. Nesbitt. Uh, she was so strange and modern at that time that I think even today she seems modern. If you look at the illustrations in the old editions, you're sometimes surprised to see the old-fashioned clothes the children are wearing. But if you just read the text, the things could have happened today or yesterday. I think it's very hard not to be influenced by her. For instance, Joan Aitken, who's a wonderful writer for children, she has very often exactly the same tone of voice that you get in E. Nesbitt. She certainly was a huge influence on me, the, the first few books I wrote. And I know she was an influence on quite a lot of other people. C.S. Lewis, for instance, his Narnia books were quite directly influenced. She really inaugurated writing for children in an ordinary voice, not her sort of didactic, commanding voice. There'd been very good children's writers in the 19th century, like Mrs. Molesworth and Mrs. Ewing, but they wrote down to children. They had a special language. But she just, like Jane Austen, I think she's the same sort of innovator as Jane Austen. She uses plain, ordinary, domestic language. I'm afraid the last chapter was rather dull. It's always dull in books when people talk and talk and don't do anything. But I was obliged to put it in, or else you wouldn't have understood all the rest. The best part of books is when things are happening. That's the best part of real things, too. This is why I shall not tell you in this story about all the days when nothing happened. You will not catch me saying, thus the sad days passed slowly by, or the years rolled on their weary course, or time went on, because it's silly. Of course time goes on, whether you say so or not. So I shall just tell you the nice, interesting parts. And in between, you'll understand that we had our meals and got up and went to bed and dull things like that. She speaks directly to children from a child's point of view. Even some of the wonderful children's writers before her took the attitude that adults know best and what a child needs to do is to find a, an adult who knows best, not always a parent, sometimes a, a magical fairy godmother or a little old man who lives down the street. But there was always the adult authority, and she did away with that. Look, don't let's burgle. Oh, don't be such a girl. Oh, grow up, Cyril. I mean, let's give her a chance first. Let's knock and ask to see her. We've tried that. Her heart might soften if she sees our distress. <laughs> that chance? Come on, then. It's worth a try, I suppose. Try first. Then <laughs> The books do lend themselves to adaptation, partly because the, of the sheer narrative drive. They do have a story. Um, but the dialogue, you can lift it straight off the page. And, and although you're obviously shooting it in period and you are aware that the dialogue is not modern, it nevertheless convinces these are real children, they have um, what she calls rows and um, cheek and, and, and use slang and all this. And, and it's totally natural, whereas I've adapted modern authors where I've hardly been able to use a word of the original dialogue. Grace, call for the police. Or be arrested and then put in prison. Oh, oh I do wish Miss Spiddle was in an angelic good temper. Why? So I am. <laughs> you just feel this narrative flow going and stuff sparking off along the way and a sort of certain streak of anarchy which appeals very strongly to me. I felt absolute affinity. I got so soaked in her that I started putting my hair up and wearing cameo brooches and almost thinking I was Ian Esbitt. Some lovers of Ian Esbitt's books probably think of her as a cosy, almost saintly figure, rather like the mother in The Railway Children. <laughs> 
In fact, though, Nesbitt was a hugely unorthodox and independently-minded character whose life was punctuated by tragedy and scandal. A great many children's writers have had complicated, unhappy childhoods. I think this is kind of standard feature. But hers was certainly even more so, and her adult life was pretty complicated and unhappy too. Ines Bitt was a wonderful writer for children, but she was something more than that. She was a very unusual person, not a typical Victorian woman in any sense. She does paint a self-portrait of herself as the mother of the railway children, who is an entirely enchanting mother. She's what everyone would like their mother to be like. But she wasn't really like mother in the railway children. She was nothing like so steady, so calm, so reliable, so adult, perhaps. She was a person of very strong, badly controlled feelings at times. Um, Self-indulgent, she liked scenes, she liked drama, she liked things to be happening. And she was quite ill-disciplined, in a way, as a child is. She was a modern woman. She was an advanced woman. She rolled her own cigarettes and smoked them through a holder, and she didn't uh, gird the loins with a corset. She had her hair cut short in the latest fashion, and she talked about interesting things. One other thing. She was a modern woman by the way that men uh, measured modernity, which is to say, that she seemed prepared to have extramarital affairs. I think she was having it off with some of the young poets who clustered round her. And if I'd been one of the young poets at the time, I'd have tried to have it off with her, certainly. I think she's a very, very attractive woman. I mean, there's something very sexy about Inez, but I think. Bossy, yeah, but such energy, you know. Rather beautiful in a funny way. Although many of her books skillfully evoke a long-vanished rural England, Nesbitt was actually born in the London borough of Kennington, an area which was just as heavily urbanised during her adult life as it is today. But the Kennington of her childhood during the 1850s was a very different place, as she herself recalled. When my father was alive, we lived in a big house in Kennington Lane where he taught young men agriculture and chemistry. My father had a big meadow and garden and a sort of small farm there. Fancy, a farm at Kennington. In 1862, when Edith was just four years old, tragedy entered her life for the first time when her father, John Nesbitt, suddenly died. In some sense, she never quite got over that. And over and over again in the children's books, the father dies, disappears, goes away. And of course, the most moving moment, I think, of all in all the children's books is that moment when Bobby is reunited with her father on the railway station, in the railway children. I'm sure that the poignancy from that scene comes very much from the fact that you really, really want that father to come back and everybody's hoping he will. And you think it might be him at the end of the film. And that is so beautifully told in the book and really beautifully shot in the film. Daddy, my daddy! Unlike Roberta, Edith was never to be reunited with her father. Instead, she endured an unsettled and often bleak upbringing, which continued to haunt her throughout her adult life. She had an older sister who was dying of TB, and her mother was constantly looking for somewhere which would improve Mary's health. And while Mrs Nesbitt was worrying about Mary, Edith, was sent off to various schools, and she was very unhappy at these different boarding schools. She remembered being punished, uh, taken for boring walks, feeling lonely, lost. To a child who is frightened, the darkness and the silence of its lonely room are only a shade less terrible than the wild horrors of dreamland. <laughs> 
One used to lie awake in the silence, listening, listening to the pad, pad of one's heart, straining one's ears to make sure that it was not the pad, pad of something else, something unspeakable, creeping towards one out of the dense dark. I used to pray fervently, tearfully, that when I should be grown up, I might never forget what I thought and felt and suffered then. Let these pages speak for me and bear witness that I have not forgotten. In the early 1870s, Edith's mother, Sarah Nesbitt, decided that the entire family should move to the continent where the cleaner air was thought to be beneficial to those suffering from TB. Voyez-vous, mademoiselle. No more measles, exceptionnel. They settled for a while in the French port of Bordeaux, and it was here that Edith experienced what she would later describe as the crowning horror of her young life. Accompanied by her dying sister, Mary, she went at her own insistence to see what was then one of Bordeaux's principal tourist attractions, a collection of so-called mummies housed in a crypt at the Church of Saint-Michel. Edith was happy and excited, expecting to be shown jeweled mummy cases, like those she had seen on a visit to the British Museum. But the mummies of Bordeaux weren't quite as presentable as their neatly bandaged Egyptian counterparts. I don't think I screamed, or cried, or even said a word. I think I was paralysed with horror. But I remember presently going back up those stairs, holding tightly to that kindly hand, and not daring to turn my head, lest one of those charnel house faces should peep out at me from some niche in the damp wall. In 1871, at the age of 19, Mary Nesbitt died. There was no longer any reason for the family to remain abroad, and so Edith's mother decided to return to England with her four remaining children. In the wake of Mary's death, um, they moved to Halstead, which is in the country, um, just south of London, and that was a period of great happiness. They lived in a house that she loved. She lived there with her brothers, and they played games, went for walks, played tennis. But also something else happened at Halstead, which was of great importance, and that was that she began writing poetry. She had a, a much older half-sister who was already publishing poetry, and she encouraged her to send a poem off to a magazine, and it was accepted. She ran round the garden, crying out with joy, and this was the beginning of her writing career. Edith felt more settled at Halstead Hall than anywhere else she'd ever lived. But her happiness wasn't destined to last. Something happened, I think, to her mother's finances, and I've never known quite what, but they moved from the very attractive house in Halstead to a house in Islington, in Barnsbury Square. And clearly at this point, the family were less well off. But the thing that is very striking is that her mother ceased to chaperone her in a way that you would expect a Victorian mama to look after her daughter. And at this point, she began to lead a life that was perhaps dangerously free. And it was at this point that she met Hubert Bland. Hubert Bland uh, was one of the founder members of the Fabian Society. He wrote a lot of essays, and he became a political journalist, basically. That was his later career. Later on, he was scarred with smallpox. But he was very handsome when young. Edith was very beautiful, it was a very beautiful young woman, and they fell for each other immediately. They shared a great deal in the way of common interests, a love of poetry, a love of books, but also a great interest in politics, and I think that brought them together at the beginning. How old was Edith when she met Hubert Bland? Probably about 20, and in fact they got married uh, when she was 22. But before that, she'd been engaged to somebody else? Yes, she was engaged to someone, and Hubert was engaged to someone. He was engaged to a girl called Maggie. And in fact, uh, at around the time when he married Edith, Maggie produced a child as well. He only seems to have found out after they were married that uh, 
actor Hubert had already got this child by his, his previous fiancée, Maggie. So she was just rather won over by a romantic character without knowing too much about... Uh, that seems to be or the case, caring yes. too much, actually, about what he was. That's right. Hubert's compulsive interest in other women was to endanger his marriage again and again in the years to come. But it wasn't his only deficiency as a husband. He also had an unfortunate tendency to embark on ill-advised business ventures, which soon landed him and Edith in very deep water. So how long after moving in here did she actually have her child? Because she was pregnant when they married. Yes, uh, Paul, in fact, was born just two months after they uh, were married. And then within a year, they had another child, Iris. So uh, she now had two children. And that's when, really, just at that point, the two disasters struck. He did have a small brush business, and uh, that was working reasonably well. But, first of all, he went down with smallpox, and he was extremely ill for about two months, and in fact, quite lucky to survive. And then uh, shortly after that, or perhaps as a result of it, um, his partner absconded with all the proceeds of their brush making business. So she had um, a husband who was unable to work mm. and two small children. That's right. And so Edith was left painting up Christmas cards and writing little poems and trying to get them published in various magazines as almost the only form of income for the whole family of four. In a way, she was almost an early single mother because although she was married to Bland, I mean, for heaven's sake, half the time she was the bread earner. And in fact, there's a line in one of the books, it's in The Railway Children, where she says, and mother spent most of every day up in her room writing, writing, writing. And she repeats it three times. And you know that E. Nesbitt feels this because this is what she did to pay the bills. In the mid-1880s, burdened by overwork and by Hubert's continuing involvement with other women, Nesbitt began to look around for a shoulder to cry on. The one she found belonged to an up-and-coming young playwright named George Bernard Shaw. He had got to know her through his membership of the Fabian Society, whose meetings they had both taken to attending. Shaw, looking for somewhere to put his energies, was fascinated by the Fabians and very quickly uh, got involved, went on the executive, and became closely associated with Hubert Bland, politically speaking. And during the course of that time, he met Edith and became attracted to her. When he went up to uh, visit uh, her and her husband, he would put on boxing gloves and do several sparring rounds with Hubert Bland, and Edith watched. And she found him surprisingly attractive. Indeed, she found him irresistible. Shaw himself was a spellbinding public speaker, and many people became mesmerised by his platform performances. But I think that Edith was tantalised by something else. It was the mystery in Shaw. He flattered her outrageously, uh, and at the same time, he laughed. So was he serious? Or was he not serious? And how did you find out? Unless you took the initiative and advanced upon him. Edith knew where to find Bernard Shaw, and that was in the reading room of the British Library, where he always worked and researched. He was doing all sorts of research on literature of various kinds. And she would go to the library uh, and then persuade him to come to lunch or persuade him to take her for a walk, persuade him to spend the afternoon with her. Hubert Bland was notoriously short-sighted. And it may be that he genuinely did not see what was going on. Or it may be that, uh, given his own record of extramarital affairs, uh, he felt he was in no position to object. Uh, my feeling is, though there is no real evidence for this, that he trusted Shaw. Um, and he was probably right to do so. And I think that uh, Edith regretted that a little bit. <laughs> One evening when they're alone together, he's playing the piano, she's singing. Um, she tells him what he, she feels about him, and Shaw panics, I think. He liked to play with women, but he didn't want to be committed. Uh, he was frightened of women, I think. And he increasingly withdrew from her, and she was terribly disappointed. 
While the storm over shore was still blowing itself out, an even greater crisis began to divide. Early in 1886, shortly after the birth of their third... And she then nursed Edith through a miscarriage, which happened shortly after Edith came here. And then Alice herself fell pregnant, and it was, of course, absolute social death for any unmarried woman to be pregnant in Victorian society. So Edith said, well, why not come and live in the household with us? And that's what Alice did. She moved in. And in fact, it was only years later that Alice very reluctantly admitted that Hubert was the father of her child. It's hard to tell at what point she began to suspect who the father was. But when Alice finally told her, of course, there was the most enormous row. And she wanted to turn Alice and the baby out of the house, but Hubert persuaded her not to. And from that point on, they became a ménage à toi. Alice was housekeeper, auntie, and looked after the children, which was a job that I think Edith was quite glad to pass on to. And in some sense, she mothered Edith's children as well as her own daughter, Rosamond. Edith didn't want to spend time looking after the children, finding them the clothes they needed to wear. Rosamond always remembered that she didn't have the right clothes, that Edith wouldn't buy her coat when she needed it. She wouldn't look into the everyday upbringing of the children, and she left all that to us. Freed from her domestic duties by the arrival of Alice Hodson, Nesbitt stepped up her production of poems and short stories and eventually became a well-known contributor to popular anthologies and magazines. These early works are now much sought after by collectors of rare books, but their quality is vastly inferior to the books which were to make her name. For 20 years, Edith Nesbitt was writing mostly hack stories and poems and essays and journalism, just trying to make ends meet for her family. Then. I think probably because the children were older and didn't require so much care, she was able to sit down and write a book that she really cared about, and that was The Treasure Seekers. It's about a family of children who go seeking for treasure, and it's narrated by one of the children, but I'm not allowed to tell you who. You have to guess that. We are the Bastables. There are six of us besides father. Our mother is dead, and if you think we don't care because I don't tell you much about her, you only show that you do not understand people at all. It is one of us that tells this story, but I shall not tell you which. Only at the very end, perhaps I will. While the story is going on, you may be trying to guess, only I bet you don't. It was Oswald who first thought of looking for treasure. Oswald often thinks of very interesting things. What I love about it is uh, the voice. I, I lo love the character of the narrator, who I'm not allowed to tell you because you have to guess, um, trying to conceal his identity and trying to conceal his personal pride um, and to, you know, try and pretend not to be narrator. It's, uh, I think it's a wonderful character that goes right through the book. Once she'd written two or three episodes, she knew that this was a great book. She sent it round to a variety of publishers and insisted that they paid her quite a large sum of money. And she said, this is an important book. And she was quite right. And when it finally was published, it was a sellout. It just made her name overnight. As she became more well-known, famous even, Edith began to attract an entourage of young male admirers several of whom almost certainly shared her bed as well as her affections. Far from disapproving of these liaisons, Hubert Bland seems to have encouraged them, and a genuinely open marriage now took shape. On more than one occasion, Edith went on a week-long boating holiday, accompanied not just by her latest boyfriend, but also by Hubert and Alice, both of whom were apparently just as willing as she was to flout the rigid morality of the time. By the early 1900s, Hubert too was enjoying great success as a well-paid political commentator. And so between them, the Blands were easily able to afford the rent on a large moated house in a small village called Eltham, now part of south-east London. Well Hall, as the house was known, was demolished during the 1930s, 
but the ground surrounding it, now a public park, look much the same today as they did during Nesbitt's lifetime. This must have been a very wonderful time in Edith's life, moving into this remarkable house, and suddenly the money was beginning to come in, so everything was pretty good. Yes, but there were still problems. First of all, she had a miscarriage, and then shortly after that, uh, Edith's son, Fabian, had an operation to remove his tonsils, and he never woke up from the operation. What almost certainly happened is he choked on his own vomit before he recovered from the anaesthetic. And what you have to remember is that any operation like that, you mustn't have breakfast. Now, in fact, when the doctors turned up in mid-morning, Fabian had already had his breakfast and was out in the garden. Edith wasn't even up and completely forgotten about it. So she hastily prepared him for the operation, presumably didn't tell the doctors that he'd already eaten. And then presumably the doctors also said, someone must stay with him after the operation until he recovers. And we know that Edith didn't because it was Hubert who went in and found him dead. And either afterwards, Edith blamed herself and I think she was probably right to do so. Far from destroying her, as it might easily have done, Fabian's death seems to have concentrated Nesbitt's mind on what she was trying to achieve in her work. Book after memorable book now flowed from her pen. In all of them, the sadness which marred her own life was kept firmly in the background, while a positive, carefree view of childhood was pushed gently to the fore. Well, things go very wrong uh, in the childhoods in her books, and sometimes they're very, very unhappy, like in The Magic City, like in The Railway Children. There, there were, this great grief uh, goes on in some of those stories, but on the whole, I think she's sort of, you know, take a sad song and make it better. She had a pretty frightening childhood, some of it, I think, and a very lonely one, some of it, and she's sort of reenacting her childhood and making a good one, making a perfect one, and sort of saying, yeah, this is what childhood can be, and that's what we should be doing. I believe in that sort of utopia. I, th I think it's helping people to imagine how children could live. One difference between the children in her stories and children now is that the children in her stories are so much freer. They can walk about, they can go anywhere, they catch trains and trams and buses. I was just looking at the amulet again and it starts off with the children in Fitzroy Street in London deciding that they'll go for the day to St James's Park and taking bread for the ducks in their pockets. You can't imagine modern children walking from Fitzroy Street to St James's Park across London. It just isn't feasible. I can almost understand their being more popular with adults than children because there is the nostalgia element, but no, children absolutely love it. I think her secret is the children themselves, the fact that she is on the side of the children, and it shows, you know. Modern books are all basically about one thing. Now, they have lots of computerised things in them, because that's what modern children like. And Ines Bitt combines modern children's ideas with old-fashioned ideas as well. Look, I know this sounds silly, but it said something. Oh, I really and truly did. You should read the books first, because they leave a lot out in the videos. You lose a lot of the plot, I think. You've gone off your nut. You lose some of the magic around it, all the descriptive words. You can't, you just can't have that in a video. And you can get that in a book. <coughs> I believe I must have dropped asleep. What is it? I like her invention. Her plots are amazing. If you read her fairy stories, they're very modern. Um, but they're very magic, but it's not sort of a nimsy-pimsy kind of magic. It's sort of real kind of tough magic which keeps going wrong. There's a marvellous episode in The Enchanted Castle where the children are putting on a play and in order to have more audience, they make themselves an audience out of umbrellas and coats and golf clubs and things. And then this audience comes to life. And that is really very frightening indeed. 
The hall was crowded with live things, strange things, all horribly short, as broomsticks and umbrellas are short. A limp hand gesticulated. A pointed white face with red cheeks looked up at him, and wide red lips said something, he couldn't tell what. The voice reminded him of the old beggar down by the bridge who had no roof to his mouth. These creatures had no roofs to their mouths, of course. I mean, that's pretty scary stuff. Um, and you get a horrible picture of these ghastly shapes that with stuffed empty sleeves. And it's, it's very frightening when she tries to be frightening. All of Nesbitt's most durable stories appeared during the 15 years leading up to the First World War, a period in which more and more attention began to be focused on the plight of the urban poor. Nesbitt, who was still an active member of the Fabian Society, held very strong views about the social divisions which riddled Edwardian Britain. And little by little, she allowed hints and echoes of her progressive opinions to seep through into her books. She felt her politics very strongly, and I, I, take, I take them seriously. I think they, uh, you know, they underline her work. Although she's never been really poor, she'd been in debt in a middle-class way, but not in poverty, which is different. She sympathised with the poor and understood them as far as she could and didn't forget them, never forgot them. I mean, she wrote an amazing poem, um, long poem, about Jesus coming back to London, which is a furious little poem. It's like uh, some of Woody Guthrie, when Woody, Woody Guthrie wrote about Jesus and said, if he came back, they'd nail him up again. You know, uh, her poem's saying that sort of thing. If Jesus came to London, came to London today, he would not go to the West End, he would come down our way. He'd see on the children's foreheads the branded gutter sign that marks the girls to be harlots, that dooms the boys to be swine. Then he'd say, what's the good of churches when these have nowhere to sleep? And how can I hear you praying when they are cursing so deep? Then some of the rich would be sorry and all would be very scared, and they'd say, but we never knew, Lord. And he'd say, you never cared. Nesbitt's continuing interest in politics and social reform brought her into close contact with the writer and thinker H.G. Wells, who was also a prominent member of the Fabian Society. Many years later, Wells was to write quite critically of both Edith and Hubert, in his book, Experiments in Autobiography, and depict them very unflatteringly in one of his novels. What has only recently emerged is that this animosity had its roots in a strange, rather comical episode that occurred in 1908. H.G. had a strong desire to overthrow what he called the old guard of the Fabian Society, which was Hubert and Shaw and a number of the other old members. And he thought he would do that with the help of the young women in society. The young women included Rosamond, Edith's adopted daughter, and H.G. clearly set out to seduce Rosamond. And there was this extraordinary episode when he uh, took her away for the weekend. They were going to meet up at the station and go perhaps to Paris for a naughty weekend. And somehow this leaked out. Hubert set off with Clifford Sharp, one of the young Fabians, who was a great admirer of Rosamond and was later to marry her, for the station uh, where he encountered H.G. and Rosamond trying to slip away. And he did what he supposed any father would have done, which was to the equivalent of horsewhipping H.G. He knocked him right across the station. Hubert, tremendously tall and powerful, an amateur boxer, H.G. small and very angry, deeply humiliated. The following year, H.G. actually seduced another young woman, Amber Reeve, made her pregnant. So this seemed to confirm H.G.'s bad behaviour, but the row between um, H.G. and the Blands rumbled on, and H.G. wrote a very violent attack on the Blands, slightly disguised in his novel, The New Machiavelli. For a while after the confrontation with Wells, life returned to normal at Well Hall. 
But then, in 1914, Hubert Bland suffered a major heart attack and died. Surprisingly, perhaps, in view of his womanizing, the effect on Edith was devastating. All accounts of their relationship describe how dependent she was on him. And I think that's something that is hard to believe, given that she was largely the financial uh, mainstay of the family, and how independent her thinking and creative writing was, the fact that she's a much better writer than he was. But people like Clifford Sharp and Rosamond described her dependence on him, and certainly the way in which she collapsed after his death suggests that that was the case. She felt desperately alone, and she was too unhappy to write. So she took in lodgers at Well Hall, tried to keep herself going, but gradually her life declined in quality, and she was rather unhappy, I think. She was still here for another eight years after his death, and she found it more and more difficult to make ends meet because after about 1914, her inspiration seems to have dried up. It may be that she was spending such a lot of time trying to pay for the upkeep of this place and pay for the rent of this place without the income either of Hubert's articles or her own writings. And as a result, she was trying to make ends meet by having chickens and, and selling their eggs, selling fruit and veg. And that's where we come into Tommy Tucker, because in fact, he was the man who built a little shed at the entrance so when she was out in the pouring rain. She didn't get soaking wet trying to sell the fruit and the veg. Thomas Terry Tucker, a former captain of the Woolwich Ferry, was known to his friends as the Skipper. He was a curious character to have entered Nesbitt's life in any way, but she grew increasingly fond of him much to the astonishment of those around her. Terry Tucker is described as a little fat cockney robin. He certainly had a very cockney accent. He dropped all his H's, which horrified her, her children, and never wore a collar in the house, apparently. It was a mark of his being a working class chap. He greatly uh, admired Edith when he first met her, and gradually came round to the house, supported her, helped her with some of her problems, and proposed marriage to her. He was a little older than her, and for him, it was a serious relationship. He was totally committed to it. He wasn't philandering with her, thinking that he would move on to another relationship later. And in some sense, this was the happiest of her love relationships, although it was also the oddest. He was a sort of very warm man, I think. He was like one of the knitted dolls almost. He was very cuddly and uh, had these fantastic stories and he used to sit there and he t used to tell us stories. And really that's much more what she needed, I think, than a sophisticated man with a monocle. It's a bit like the happy ending of the railway children, really, where the little girl finds her daddy. That was a big search in her life to find her daddy and in a way she found him in Thomas Tucker. In 1922, while on holiday in Kent, Edith Nesbitt and Thomas Tucker caught sight of two disused army storehouses close to what is now the Romney, Hythe and Dimchurch railway line. Forced to move out of Well Hall because they could no longer afford the rent, they decided to buy the rundown buildings and convert them into an unlikely home. It was here that Nesbitt was to spend her declining years among somewhat eccentric and decidedly ungrand surroundings. Custom built for her by the skipper himself. So here we are inside the jolly boat and the other cabin was called the, the long boat. He was a very nautical man. He referred to the kitchen here as the, the galley and then all the bedrooms down there with the cabins and so on. And why did they end up here, though? I suppose they ended up here because uh, this is not far from Dimchurch, and uh, Dimchurch was somewhere that Edith had known for 20, 30 years, really. And uh, there were still a few friends around, um, people like Athene Siler and Sybil Thorndike actresses would, would be seen around. They had local houses here. So uh, there were quite a lot of local connections. But presumably there was much less money. Why, why would that have been? Well, she was very generous and charitable. I mean, she used to put on parties which eventually resulted in a thousand children being up for a, a free party. And uh, after 10 years, the, the, the thousand children just proved a bit too much. And they, people commented when they visited her that there was nearly always a waif and a stray or someone's odd relation staying and being looked after. So she went through all her money as soon as she had it. <laughs> 
So this is where she lived when she died? Yes, that's right. I mean, we now know, because she was a chain smoker, that she must have been suffering from lung cancer, and that is what eventually killed her. She spent some two years being seriously ill and then finally died here in 1924. I've loved visiting the places that she uh, lived in as a child and grew up and stayed in all through her life. One wonders sometimes whether she ever grew up into a responsible adult. She, she clearly was a, a, a complex person, an extraordinary person, um, but perhaps not a nice person in the way the Edwardians meant it, you know, in, in terms of society of that time. Um, but as Roberta said in The Railway Children of her writer mother, uh, she did not sit dully at home waiting for dull ladies to pay visits or go around paying dull visits to dull ladies around the place. She lived her life to the full and looked at every kind of element of humanity and uh, I, I think it's why she is so readable today. Of course, there were heaps of sand fairies then and in the morning early you went out and hunted for them and when you found one, it gave you your wish. People used to send their little boys down to the seashore early in the morning before breakfast to get the day's wishes. I think an adult's a fool if an adult can't enjoy the books of E. Nesbitt. She's a better writer than most children's writers, and she's a better writer than most writers for adults, too. When people had dinner parties, it was nearly always Megatheriums and Ichthyosaurus, because his fins were a great delicacy and his tail. I think that the chances of her still being around in 50 years' time are almost better than any other writer I personally can think of. There's always going to be readers, real readers, and as long as there are real readers, there'll be E. Nesbitt. The Edwardians' The Birth of Now season continues after World News. Details on tonight's highlights up next. <laughs>